Revelation 13, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 10. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. His deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. They worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? He was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. He was given authority to continue for 42 months. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the uh, book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So we're going to be looking tonight at the kingdom of the Antichrist as well as Antichrist. As we begin, let me introduce tonight's study by by making a couple of comments, some basic statements to lay a foundation. We live in a world that is very familiar with something that we today just refer to as knockoffs. A knockoff is an unlicensed copy of something intended to be sold at a lower price than the original. And so we know that there are knockoffs of a variety of products, jewelry, makeup, jeans, purses, shoes, CDs, DVDs, furniture, artwork, cologne, classic cars, sunglasses, watches. They're knockoffs. When we go into certain portions of Los Angeles or you can go into various cities and you'll be walking and people will take you as a, a tourist and they'll approach you and they'll say, oh, I have a Louis Vuitton purse, you know, they'll tell Marie. And, or they'll say, oh, we have a Rolex watch. And they're knockoffs. You know, you look at the Rolex watch and it's got Timex written on it. But, you know, but they'll say, you know, oh, we have, they're just simply knockoffs. And, and the bottom line is the knockoff may look like the original, but obviously can never match the quality of the original. That's because there is something that is genuine. And again, there are those things that are simply fake. Satan is in the business of producing knockoffs. He presents something that looks genuine, but in reality, what is being presented does not match the quality of the original. When you read your Bible, you'll discover that he presents a false Jesus, a false spirit, a false gospel. He has false ministers, and he promises a false kingdom. When Paul was writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, he said this. He said, I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he, comes, he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Different Jesus, different spirit, different gospel. That's what he does. Satan produces things that are similar, but are not genuine. He even has false Christians. There are those who believe that they are Christians, and they're planted in every church. In one form or another, you will find them in churches. He even performs false miracles. And so when you look at this one who produces knockoffs, we know that God has a son, his, the Messiah, Jesus, but Satan will raise up a counterfeit Messiah 
And this one is referred to in Scripture as Antichrist. Now, Antichrist will not be clearly recognizable, not from outer appearances. He will not have the outer trappings of evil. He's not going to have eyes that glow in the dark and smoke that rises from his clothing. He's not going to have horns or a tail of any sort. He's not going to have that at all. There is going to be something about him that is amazingly attractive. There is, and I, I'll, ha I'll hesitate to go any further than simply saying this, there is something called the beautiful side of evil. And the enemy has a beautiful side he presents to you. He does. Think about it for a minute. For those of you who struggled with alcohol, didn't he present it to you as being something that was enjoyable, even cool? Didn't he? He did. Of course he did. The commercials that you saw growing up that you see even to this day always have very cool, very sophisticated, very well-built people who are drinking in those bars. They always are drinking moderately. He never shows you what really takes place. He never shows you the alcoholic. When he encouraged you to be so cool, to do whatever it is that you thought was cool because other people were doing it, he never told you the price that you'd ultimately pay when you succumbed to the temptation and got habituated to that drug or whatever it may have been. It's always presented as beautiful. So it doesn't have, the things that he does, um, does not have outer trappings of, of evil. And he certainly, the Antichrist, will not have an outer appearance of being evil at all. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 and 14, Paul said, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. No wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. And that's what deception is, you see. And Satan will present himself as, as truth, and he has one who will go before uh, that he will give his power to named Antichrist, who will do the same. Antichrist is going to be attractive. He's going to be engaging. He's going to be intelligent. He will be eloquent. He will be educated. He will be charismatic. He will have a persuasive personality. He's going to fit in with the world's movers and shakers. He's going to have friends who undoubtedly are, are involved in, in, in Hollywood movie productions. He's going to be able to speak and involve, be involved in politics. You're going to see this man more than likely on some talk shows. He's going to fit in lecturing in major universities. He will be able to give speeches to Congress or to the United Nations. He's going to present to the world solutions to terrorism, to uh, the climate situation. He's going to uh, bring uh, uh, a cessation of tension in the world. He's going to deal with terrorism. What he's going to do is he's going to draw the admiration of the world. Notice what it says in verse 4, where it says, they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who's like him? Notice what it says again in verse 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. He is going to be a charismatic, magnetic, eloquent, intellectual personality. And people will follow after him. Now, as we speak about him, because we find him here in, in Revelation chapter 13, there are those who would say, is it really important for us to spend much time looking at Antichrist? Well, we need to remember that it's been presented that he is the subject of over 100 passages in Scripture. He's referred to in various portions of Scripture, like 2 Thessalonians and 1 John. He's there in the book of Daniel, and obviously he's a main figure here in the book of Revelation. And so I would say that if the Bible pays that much attention to him, we need to study what Scripture has to say about him. Now, there are those who, who ask or wonder, is he presently on earth? We don't know. But we do know this, every day brings his emergence closer. And as we take a view of Scripture and as it relates to him, naturally going through the counsel of God, 
we also get a view of this Antichrist. And that's who we're looking at here in Revelation chapter 13. So at verse 1, John says, I stood on the sand of the sea. I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now, just looking at it briefly and just touching it, I stood on the sand of the sea. There are those who would say that this is a literal sea, that he's emerging and they see him there on the seashore. They would say this could possibly be the Mediterranean. But uh, I say that only because there are those who would think so. But actually, it would appear more clearly that he's speaking of what would be called the Sea of Humanity. Uh, Revelation 17, 15, uh, he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So he's going to arise out of the Sea of Humanity. So out of the Sea of Humanity emerges Antichrist. Now, we know him as the Antichrist. There are various names and titles given to him in, in Scripture. He's called the man of sin. He's called the son of perdition. He's referred to as the lawless one. He's the little horn. He's also referred to as the beast. But he is especially known by the name Antichrist. The word anti can be used, the prefix anti can be used to mean uh, in opposition to. Or it can also speak of being instead of. And so the Antichrist is actually both. He's instead of Christ and in opposition to Jesus Christ. During the tribulation, he will rise to power. He'll rise to power because it will be a time of chaos and confusion. There are going to be people looking for, even as they are right now, and longing for someone who can bring peace to this confused, crazy, war-torn world. They are looking for even now a strong and charismatic leader who's going to be able to pull the world back together. And it's during that time that he will emerge. And he's going to strengthen his hold on his power and he's going to deceive the world during that time. Now, how is it that he's going to be welcomed in such a way? How can Antichrist be welcomed? Let me give you a couple of things about that. One, we need to know that the world has been prepared to receive such a person throughout the church's history. The spirit of Antichrist has been in the world for 2,000 years. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. In chapter 4, verse 3 of 1 John, every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So the world already has the spirit of Antichrist. It's an atmosphere of rejecting Jesus Christ. And so what will happen and what we've seen up to this point and will continue until he makes his, his uh, appearance on earth, is false prophets prepare the way for him, and as they prepare the way for him, they begin to foster an atmosphere of acceptance for the Antichrist. You see, people already, because of the rejection of the gospel, are disposed to receive what Antichrist will present. They already are ready to do that. Listen, people don't have a problem with you as a Christian. They don't, as long as you don't insist that they become one. It's fine. You want to be religious? I'm good with that, they'll say. It doesn't bother me at all. Just what? Don't push your religious faith on me. I don't have a problem with you Christians. Christians do some good things, and I think that's great, some will say. You know, you're really caught up with doing charitable things, and as long as you continue doing charitable things and stay out of my business, I'm good with you because we need more people like you. Let's face it. We need people who are out there who are taking care of the homeless and taking care of the needy and things like that. And, and I admire you for that. Just don't insist that I have to be like that because that may be good for you, but it isn't good for me. So people don't have a problem in general. Of course, there are those who are very greatly opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ and everything religious, but not everybody's like that. There are quite a number of, of people who have, you know, kind of like just, Indifferent spirits concerning that. 
there's already an attitude of rejection of Jesus Christ, and that's called the spirit of Antichrist. It already exists. So the message that Antichrist is going to bring is going to find a ready and receptive audience. The things that he's going to say will be things that they want to hear. In, Jer in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 31, it says, Prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. And so just tell me things. Don't prophesy hard things. Just prophesy smooth things. Tell me something that I want to hear. There's an old song Fleetwood Mac sang, so this is an ancient one. Some of you would, don't even know who Fleetwood Mac, but tell me lies, tell me lies, sweet little lies. Don't tell me the truth. Tell me something that appeals to me. Tell me something that makes me feel better about myself. I don't mind it if it makes me feel good. Lamentations 2.14, your prophets have, have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not uncovered your iniquity to bring back your captives, but have envisioned for you false prophecies and delusions. And so the Lord is simply saying, listen, instead of speaking truth, your prophets have prophesied falsehood, and in doing so have kept you captive to your sin. When Jesus was teaching his disciples, he said that deception would be the premier mark that we are living in the last days. It says in Matthew 24, 3 through 5, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. What is the primary mark? What is the sign? Jesus said, deception. And so the spirit of Antichrist exists. Rejection of the message of God has continued through the history that God has been attempting to reach man and will continue into these last days. There's an event that we've already touched on called the rapture. And after this event of the rapture occurs, there will be a great rejection of Jesus Christ. There will be false prophets who continue to abound. They will continue to proclaim Antichrist and will do so saying he is the Messiah of the world. And at that time, the man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition, the one we know as Antichrist. Now again, in verse 1, I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast. When he says I saw a beast, this word beast in the original language speaks of a description of a vicious monster rising out of the sea. He has seven heads, ten horns, and on the horns he said ten crowns. The seven heads represent kings. We see that in Revelation 17, verse 3. The horns, well, horns in the Bible very often are used to denote power. Horns can speak of power. Psalm 75, 10, I will cut off the horns of all the wicked, but the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. So that speaks of power. So you have kings, you have power, you have crowns. Crowns are symbolic of governmental authority. They could also be representative of nations. On each head, he says, there are blasphemous names. The blasphemous names give to us the nature of his kingdom. It's blasphemous. Now, in verse 2, the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. This is a description of what is called the kingdom of Antichrist. Daniel was a prophet in the Old Testament. He prophesied over 600 years before Christ. And in the book of Daniel, if you take notes, it's found in chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. The prophet Daniel had a dream, and in his dream, what he saw was successive kingdoms that would arise over time that culminated in the Antichrist kingdom. When you read Daniel 7, 1 through 8, he says that in his dream, he saw a lion, he saw a bear, he saw a leopard, and then he speaks of a terrible, strong beast. While the three 
first descriptions that he saw in Daniel 7 are the same that are given to us here in Revelation chapter 13. And so what is being spoken of here is successive kingdoms with the culminating kingdom being kingdom of Antichrist. Let me give to you Daniel 7, 23 through 25. It, it says, this is where the interpretation was given to Daniel. It says, he said to me, this fourth beast is the fourth world power that will rule the earth. It will be different from all the others. It will devour the whole world, trampling and crushing everything in its path. Its ten horns are ten kings who will rule that empire. Then another king will arise, different from the other ten, who will subdue three of them. He will defy the Most High, oppress the holy people of the Most High. He will try to change their sacred festivals and laws. They will be placed under his control for a time, times, and half a time. They will be under his strict control for three and a half years. And so, there are those who would believe that the Antichrist, when you begin to look, and I didn't prepare this because I didn't want to go into much detail with this, but um, that the successive kingdoms that you see in history, you know, the Babylonian, Medo-Persian, and the Greek that are in reference, they're being referenced here in Daniel. Um, then you have this last empire that comes up. Um, that would be the revived Roman Empire. Uh, there are those who believe that in the end times there will be something that is like a revived Roman Empire because uh, something interestingly enough is that the other three um, uh, kingdoms that are mentioned, Babylon, Medo-Persia and, and Greece, all of them had a time period where they existed and then finally ceased to exist. They all were overcome. They were all um, taken by other, by other kingdoms and all. Um, but the one that did not fall uh, in such a manner is the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was never overwhelmed by other armies. They didn't lose that way. Um, there are historians that will present real strong cases that the Roman Empire actually didn't fall in that fashion. It actually fell from the corruption and rottenness from within. It wasn't destroyed by, uh, by other armies. It was destroyed by its own corruption. And so it is, uh, this Antichrist kingdom is going to be more than likely a revived Roman Empire with a, with a world ruler who will be um, having his way as he oversees this renewed uh, empire that is going to be reestablished in these last days. Now, one of the things we see in verse 2 is this. Notice it says the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So the dragon is Satan. And so Satan is going to give to Antichrist these things. He is going to develop a government that is satanically empowered and is a dictatorship. That's what he's saying. The dragon, verse 2, gave him his power. Now, in verse 3, I saw one of the heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Now, some see this as an assassination attempt. And what we have here is a counterfeit death, burial, and resurrection. And so what he's trying to do is give the appearance that he is the Messiah. And so this is what will more than likely take place. And the result is going to be, notice verse 3, the world marveled and followed. It's going to be something that draws their attention. When it says the world marveled, he's not a local leader, but he is a world leader. And what do they do? Verse 4, they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast. So he's going to receive worship from the unbelieving world. This is the heart of Satan's rebellion. All the way from the beginning, Satan said, I will be like the Most High. I will be worshipped. His desire to receive worship is well chronicled in Scripture. And that's what he wants. He wants to finally have those in this world who finally will give him his worship. He even went so far as to attempt to get Jesus Christ himself to fall down before him and worship him. 
And that is the great heartbeat of Satan, the desire to receive worship, to be the center of all attention. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. That day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. He'll establish a covenant with the nation of Israel. As mentioned in Revelation 11, I pointed out that he will make a treaty, a covenant. It would seem undoubtedly that this treaty or covenant that he'll have with the nation is going to make it possible for them to rebuild their temple. We know that the Jews already have, there is a sect there, a group of Jews there to this day at this moment who already have the plans for the temple. They have everything set up. They're just waiting for opportunity to rebuild it. Every time we go to Israel, we'll take you to this place called uh, Holy Land Institute. And we'll take you into this place. You will see the high priestly robes I've mentioned to you before. Uh, you, you will see the implements that they have already there prepared for, the, um, for, uh, for sacrifice. They have pretty much almost everything, almost everything set up in, and, and just waiting for the opportunity to once again have um, temple sacrifice. Uh, I was speaking to one of my guides, a, a Jewish woman, who is now a uh, reformed uh, rabbi, and uh, her name is Helen. And I was speaking to Helen on one occasion, and I said to her something concerning the temple and concerning temple sacrifice, and I said to her that it would necessitate um, that uh, the uh, priests be trained in the proper way to perform uh, temple sacrifice. And she, she, she was one of these very outspoken women, and I loved her dearly, and and she, but she was very blunt and to the point. And she, she said to me, and she gave me this disdainful look, and she said, we have never stopped knowing how to do sacrifice. She says, the priests, they're called Kohanim, the priests are already trained. She says, they're already trained. They exist right now. They know how to do it. We're just waiting for the opportunity to do it. And this was like 20 years or more ago that she and I were speaking, and, and, and they've been ready before then and continue to be up to this point. They are ready. They are ready for the, the use of a temple, but, but there's, there's no way they could put a temple there, right? I mean, because you have the Dome of the Rock. You have the Al-Aqsa Mosque there. It, it is uh, one of the holiest sites in Islam. How are you going to do that? We've already looked at how there will be a covenant and, and a portion of that uh, property is going to be given over to, uh, to allow the continuation of that mosque and for the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. And uh, that is going to be orchestrated by Antichrist. And the people will say, as he's doing this, who can make war with him? Who is like him? This is an amazing world ruler who is capable of bringing peace to the Middle East. And so when that is done, the nation of Israel in the middle of the tribulation, well, it's going to become, they're going to become aware of the fact that they've been deceived because he's going to present himself in a place to be worshipped. And in doing so, all hell literally breaks out on earth. And the Antichrist and his tactics are revealed for what they are. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10, it says the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Now notice in verse 5, he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. His tactic, blasphemy. The word blaspheme means to reduce. He reduces God Almighty. Daniel 7.25 says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. The word pompous means self-important words. Daniel 11, 36 and 37, The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god, will say unheard of things against the God of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. Antichrist. 
Notice how verse 5 says he was given authority to continue for 42 months. He was given authority, meaning his authority is limited by God, and he will not rule as he would like forever. Now, he does exercise authority during the seven-year period of the tribulation, but his complete rule doesn't materialize until the last three and a half years, which is called the Great Tribulation. And again, it begins after he breaks his covenant with Israel. In 1 Thessalonians 5.3, it says, While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Peace and safety, finally. When you go to Israel, you will meet people, should you have an opportunity to visit with Jews who uh, are living there in Israel, and you will meet people who will say things to you like, I've been here since 1958, and I haven't had a single night, single night of peace in, my, in all these years. I mean, there's, there's such chaos, and there is such, not so much chaos, because it's a very orderly society, but there's so much oppression. There's so much uh, anti-Israel sentiment. There, there are those who, who do not believe that Israel has a right to exist, and, and some who would do anything they can to destroy them from the face of the earth, and therefore they know that they live under the hammer. They know that. And then the Antichrist comes, and then you have these people who've lived in Israel for years who finally are saying, peace and safety. I can put my head on my pillow at night, and I'm not concerned anymore. And that's when sudden destruction comes. That's when he reveals himself for what he is. Now, the Antichrist. Who can make war with him? Who is like him? He's a peacemaker, eloquent, charismatic, powerful. But he will be completely defeated at the return of Jesus. In Revelation 19, 20, the beast was captured with him, the false prophet who had performed miraculous signs on his behalf, with these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Praise you, Jesus, because that's what's going to happen. Now, verse 6 and 7, he opened his mouth in blasphemy. He is Satan's mouthpiece, and he utters contempt and irreverence towards God and all things holy. Um, as believers, I don't think that every time you hear God's name being used in vain, I don't believe that you should turn around and pop somebody in the head for doing that. But have you noticed how that his name being used in vain is totally acceptable and there are other words that you simply better never, ever say? And I think that, that there are certain words that are inappropriate all, at all times. I have no disagreement. I don't think that you should use slurs and racial comments. Uh, of course not. Of course you shouldn't. I mean, that, that's just... That's just indecent. That's just not proper. But it, it still amazes me that you might be watching a movie and God's name, God's name will just be thrown out there in a filthy way and nobody blinks. The same people in the same movie would never think of using racial slurs or homophobic slurs, as they call them today. They would never even think of doing that. So it's okay to use the name of God in vain. And, and to use the name of the Lord in vain, God said, I will not hold him guiltless who uses my name in vain. So it isn't something light with the Lord at all. He, he was angry at Israel. It's mentioned in Romans uh, where he says, uh, because of you, the name of God is blasphemed amongst the Gentiles. The name that, that, that Jews, if you have Jewish friends, when they write to you and if they were to write in the conclusion, if they say, God bless you, have you ever noticed those of you who may have Jewish friends, they won't write the name, they won't use the word God. They just put uh, the, uh, the letter G, then an underline, and then the letter D. They don't even write the word God out to you because they say that is the unnameable name. It is the name that is not to be used. Even the word God, they will not write out, even to this day. I get letters sometimes from people who are Messianic believers, and they'll do the same thing. They'll write G, underline D, bless you. That's what they do. Because in the Jewish religious system, the name of God was to be reverenced and held high. It, it, it was something that, that, that is holy. And, all, and he's saying, 
that the Antichrist will blaspheme and will bring contempt to God. He's Satan's mouthpiece. He says in verse 7 that he persecutes the Jews as well as Gentile believers. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So many believers worldwide will be persecuted and they will perish as martyrs. The dream of worldwide conquest is going to be realized by Antichrist. This is a counterfeit of the millennial reign of Jesus. But in reality, it's the great tribulation. It results in worldwide war, but is consummated by the return of Jesus Christ. It says in verse 8, and all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. These who are going to worship him are unsaved Jews and the Gentiles who have rejected the true Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Those who say they worship nothing in reality worship everything. And ultimately, when the enemy, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, because it's going to be such a worldwide acceptance, there are going to be people who suspend their disbelief and join in with the parade, if you will, of those who accept him. I, I, I don't know how to put this, and perhaps I, I should be careful as I do, but I really believe that we have in our society today that we have a general population that is very susceptible to deception and to a mentality of if it appears something, it must be true, and therefore follow after that because it seems to be true to me, to the point that if you disagree with them and say, but there must be evidence on the other side, we haven't gotten all the evidence in yet, you need to be looking at both sides of the equation to see what's really taking place. You will be rejected because you aren't thinking groupthink like everybody else. Christians don't think groupthink. They call us lemmings. They say, oh, you guys are marching to the cliff and you're all going to just fall off together. But the fact is, is the world is under delusion. The world has, suffers from groupthink. Um, okay, here we go. Here's just a simple illustration. Um, but we, we do. We just, we just kind of, if you do it, I'll do it, that kind of thing. You know, and, I, and I'm not putting it down. That's why I'm trying to be careful with this because I think it's just interesting. It's observable and I can use it as an illustration. So we have a nice bucket challenge. And before you know it, it goes all over, right? Because of Facebook and various things. A lot of people knew it already when I mentioned Ice Bucket Challenge. You know, people knew it. Why? Because it's become popular very quickly. It, it originally is established apparently for the ALS, you know, to, you know, donations to help with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease and all. And we understand uh, research and the desire for research, and that's fine with me and all of that. And yet at the same time, if something is posted before you know it, you've got a thousand hits and then you've got a million hits. And then before you know it, you get hits from Alaska to Hawaii to every part of the earth because they get on the bandwagon very easily. We all, we, you know, we do. People do that. It just happens. We do that with almost everything. It becomes popular right now and it's real popular for a while, then it dies off, and then something new popular happens, and we get into that bandwagon, and that's kind of how it works, isn't it? So whatever is latest and what is new, we do that in, every, in everything. I mean, there, there, are, there are people who have no musical talent who make a lot of money, even though they have no musical talent. And, and that's because people like what they're doing. And, and I'm not knocking that. That's just a fact. They just, they just get on the bandwagon. We do that. Uh, we sometimes will elect political officials based on popularity rather than qualifications. We've done that. We do that because we don't think through issues. We don't look into the future. We get on the bandwagon. So if we can do that with our own political officials, and we do, and it can be in any state and it can be in any election, if we get on a bandwagon because we like this person because they appeal to us, what makes us think that this world is going to have the discernment to know when the Antichrist has made his appearance? What makes me think that people are going to be able to discern that this is evil when he's doing signs and wonders, when he's bringing world peace, 
when he's so handsome, eloquent, educated, when he is so incredibly impressive, we are ready for a world leader to stand up and say, this is what needs to be done. Let's do it. We're ready. We're ready right now for it. I see that the United States and the world is looking for a great leader, undoubtedly. And he is in the wings waiting to make his appearance. And he will before you know it. When it says all who dwell on the earth will worship him, all the unsaved Jews and Gentiles of the world will. And then finally we read, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. Who kill, he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. And here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So we've been warned. There is today a spirit of ecumenicalism where you will see someone drive down the street and you'll have symbols of various world religions and basically wants us just to all get along. And every one of them is true. We already have this spirit of ecumenicalism, and that spirit is going to continue to grow. Ultimately, the world will wonder after Antichrist. The fact is, Christians will resist, but the Christians will be persecuted to death. Jesus said it like this, Whenever you're arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at that time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Hold fast. He who stands firm to the end will be saved. Now, I'll close with one last thought, and that is, as believers in Christ right now, one of the things, as I read through this, that I always close in my own mind, so I'm saying it out loud, is, thank you, Jesus. I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to be here. Jesus is going to take us. So... We, we used to say, in the early days, we used to say, so those of you who are refusing Jesus, you will be here. Don't take the mark. Don't take the mark. You'll see what I mean if you come back and we see the mark of the beast. But we used to always close by saying, don't take the mark. 